Welcome back to All About Winning Daily Fantasy Sports. My name is Ty Patton. Sadly, the last week of the NFL regular season is upon us. Week 17 is always difficult to dissect because of the teams who are, one, either eliminated and not playing for anything at all, or playoff teams that are resting their starters because they have to play in the first round of the playoffs, which is next weekend, and they don't have anything to um, lose or gain by playing their starters. So obviously, I want to focus on the games that have the players that are either playing to get in the playoffs or they have something to play for, such as the first round bye. I wanted to run down a few of the game scenarios, playoff scenarios for you guys before we jump into this, um, the player pool in this chart. Um, real quick, Kansas City can gain a first round bye with a win and a New England loss. They play at the same time tomorrow at 1 o'clock, so there won't be any... Uh, scoreboard watching or scenarios in the past, like say if Kansas City played at four o'clock, New England played at one, New England wins and Kansas City can't gain anything, so they rest their starters. That's not going to happen. One thing with this game that I am concerned about is if Reed sees that New England is putting Miami away and realizing that they will have to play next week if this might limit the um, activity of his starters, and he might start to pull starters out of this game tomorrow. That's the one thing that concerns me with Kansas City. Um, so Kansas City, as I said, they need they need a win and a New England loss to Miami, and they can get a first-round bye. New England, who I mentioned also plays at 1 o'clock, they get a first-round bye with a win. They don't need anything else to happen. They beat Miami. Um they get the first round by, or if they lost to Miami and Kansas City lost to the Chargers, they get the first round by. But they're going to be all hands on deck. They're going to try to put Miami away and get that first round by. Oakland, they play at 425. They have the biggest um, group of things that has to happen for them to get in the playoffs. But they needed a lot of things to happen last weekend for them to be relevant this weekend, and it, and it happened last weekend. So, But this weekend, they need... First off, they have to win versus Denver. Second, they need Pittsburgh to lose to Baltimore. They need Tennessee to lose to Houston. And they need Indianapolis to beat Jacksonville. Now, if all those things happen, they need one of the following things to happen. They either need Chicago to beat Minnesota, Detroit to beat the Packers, the Chargers to beat Kansas City, or New England to beat Miami. So all that happens, and they can get in the playoffs. I'm not sure that they have a really good shot, but you never know. There was a lot of things, as I mentioned, that had to happen last week, and it happened for them to be relevant this weekend. Pittsburgh, they get in. Um, they can clinch a playoff spot with a win and a Tennessee loss, so they need some help. They, they play at the same time as Tennessee at 4 o'clock, so they, you know, they're going to be going all out. Tennessee... Um, they clinch the playoff spot with a win. They don't need any help. So they they win, they're in. So they're going to be going um, all out against Houston. Dallas, they need to win, and they need a Philadelphia loss to the Giants. They play at the same time as Philadelphia. So they um, they will be all hands on deck as well, and um, need, they need to win, and they need um, Philly to lose. Green Bay, they have a lot riding on tomorrow's game. Um, first off, they get a first round bye with a win. Then, if they beat Detroit, if San Francisco loses to Seattle, Green Bay is going to get home field advantage through, throughout the playoffs. So they're playing for a, a lot tomorrow, and they're going to come out uh, guns blazing against Detroit. And there's lots of ways to stack and look at this game, and we'll get into that when we get into the chart. But Green Bay is playing for a lot tomorrow. New Orleans, who plays, and Green Bay plays at 1 o'clock. New Orleans, who also plays at 1 o'clock, at the same time as Green Bay, they can get the first round by. They have to win, and they need Green Bay to lose to Detroit. So, obviously, that's going to be a difficult task for Detroit to beat Green Bay, but New Orleans plays at the same time as Green Bay. They're going to have all hands on deck trying to get that first round by, too. And then New Orleans can also get home field advantage through the playoffs if something would happen. Green Bay loses to Detroit and San Fran loses to Seattle. So both those teams, New Orleans and Green Bay, are playing for a lot tomorrow. As I mentioned about Dallas, Philadelphia clinches the NFC East in a playoff spot, the number four seed, um, with a win, 
against the Giants, or if Dallas would lose to Washington, they would win the NFC East pretty much by default. Um, the NFL, they did a really great job of making all these relevant games at times that coincide with the teams that can affect their outcomes. I really like that. Now, I've developed this chart. It's a little bit different than what I've done through the season. About midway through the season, I started using charts and things for you guys in different numbers. Um, I wanted to do a combined chart this week, and I'll scroll up and down and pause it enough if you want to use it, screenshot it, or however you want to look, look at my notes or the numbers. I did use a, a couple. I'll just go over the chart real quick with you. Um, obviously, I have it broken down by position up here at the top. we got the quarterbacks. Here we have running backs. <clears throat> Next is tight ends, wide receivers, and then defense special teams at the bottom. Um, you have the position, their team, what their salary is on DraftKings, the um, ranking of their opponent versus that position, the ceiling for fantasy points, and the floor for fantasy points. And this is um, done, a site that I use, this is done by looking at um, projections and matchups and um, algorithms that they use. And, you know, and, and I'll explain this a little bit more when we get to some of these players. And the last column over here, it's kind of close to my notes, is the projected ownership numbers um, as of yesterday um, from a site that I use, a paid site that I use. So I want to get get started with this and just jump right into it. I'm going to start out with the quarterbacks. Patrick Mahomes, he's 7,200. Now, the Chargers are a difficult matchup versus the passing game. So this is an easy matchup for um, the Chiefs in their passing game. You can run the ball on the on the Chargers, though. They give up a little bit more to the running game. So the Ch Chargers come in with a ranking of number four versus the quarterback position. Now the ceiling for Mahomes is 27.27 fantasy points, and the floor is 13.96. You need 21 points to get value, a little bit more than 21 points to get value. So if he was towards the high end of this, um, towards the ceiling, that would give you value. The thing that worries me about Mahomes, obviously, is what I talked about um, earlier. And here in my notes, you can see they can clinch a first round by with a win and a New England loss to Miami. And I put not probable. I'm concerned that Reed pulls starters if New, New England pulls away from Miami. And that would definitely, obviously, limit his ceiling. And knowing that the Chargers are easier to move the ball on the ground against if the running game gets going, that's when you start dropping off your ceiling and going towards the floor. And if you fall somewhere in there, you know, then you're, you know, you're still trying to get to that at least 21 points for the low value. So I'm not sure that I'm going to get to my homes much. Um, just, just a lot to factor into this um, game. And I really, there's other quarterbacks that I like at lower prices. He's the most expensive this week. And um, it takes a lot for him to get to get to that 27. It doesn't, it may not seem like a lot, but it takes a lot for him to get there in this game against a team that's a difficult matchup. Next up is Drew Brees from New Orleans. He's 7,000. Carolina's number 13 versus the quarterback position. He does have a really high ceiling his floor, this is another one that scares me because, first of all, read my notes here, can clinch a first round buy and potentially more, but it all begins with a win. Carolina's defense is number 32 versus the running back position. That's what scares me about Drew Brees and his ceiling. The may pivot off of Brees to Kamara and Murray. That might be the move because if the running game gets going, this ceiling could definitely fall way off towards that floor. And this is another one where you need at least, you know, 21 points for him to get value, which you're looking at, you know, 300 yards and, and a touch, two touchdowns to get there. Now he can get there. I mean, obviously Michael Thomas is virtually matchup proof, but if they get the running, but running game going and they'll probably scoreboard a little bit. They're going to be playing at the same time as, as New Orleans and they as Green Bay, and they know that if Green Bay wins, they can't get home field advantage or they can't get a first round by or home field. So um, that's something to 
consider too. So these top two quarterbacks, I'm not sure that I'm going to get there. Yeah, they'll be there. Uh, his ownership is uh, 11% right now, and Mahomes is nine. And this is just out of the players that I'm using in my player pool. Um, so I'm just, I'm just not sure that I'm going to get up there. There's some other places that I'd like to spend up for, and I feel like this this is real iffy and neat. In games that are big favorites, I oftentimes go with the running if a team is a double-digit favorite, such as um, um, this game here, New Orleans. I have a lot of interest in the uh, running game. It just makes sense in a game theory. Um, so, not sure that I'm going to get. Excuse me, that I'm going to get there. They do have really high ceilings, but you need the other team to be pushing back. You need Carolina to be pushing back, which could be possible um, with Christian McCaffrey and um, Carolina. So, and some of these teams, this is their that aren't playing for anything, playing for pride. And if they can knock you out of, you know, getting what you're trying to achieve, it's kind of like a Super Bowl game for them. Next up, Aaron Rodgers. He has a fantastic matchup. His um, ceiling, he. 6,900. Detroit is number 27 versus the quarterback position. He has a ceiling of 30.89 and a floor of 7.88. And similar situation to Mahomes and Breeze. Um, can clinch a first round by with a win and home field throughout with a win and a San Fran loss. Inside, no weather concerns in a fantastic matchup. And I put yes, please. I do like this, and but the more I looked at it, I thought... He should be involved a lot early, and if they put away Detroit fairly easy, maybe he can get his before they go to the running game. Now, Jamal Williams is out tomorrow, so it'll be the Aaron Jones um, at running back who's going to get all the snaps and carries and touches. So, But I'm, I'm wondering if Rodgers can do just enough to pay off this 21 and then fall back on the running game, or if they get the running, if they get the running ba- uh, game going, and because Detroit is horrible versus the run, number twenty nine versus the um, run. So if they get the running game going, he won't have to be throwing a lot, and they could rely on their defense, who's going up against a uh, rookie quarterback. So then you start falling off the ceiling and start getting into numbers in between the ceiling and the floor. So that's that's a little bit scary. And concerns me some. Then I have that same concern with all three of those quarterbacks. Next up, Ryan Tannehill. I have him in in yellow. Um, I think I have. I well, the main reason I have him in yellow is because Derrick Henry's due back tomorrow. And if they get the running game going, you can temper your expectations for Tannehill. Now they're in a little bit different position than the. the Three quarter, but he's in a different position than the three quarters I just talked about. He's not in the playoffs. He's trying to get in the playoffs. So I expect them to throw the ball, and I'm not sure how much they'll use um, Henry. But if they get him going, they like they definitely like to pound him. But Houston has a uh, DVP of 30 versus the quarterback position. He's 6800, has a nice ceiling of 30.25. The floor seems pretty safe. Um, they're trying to get in the playoffs when you're in scenario for the Titans with Derrick Henry expected back, which could limit the Taney Hill upside. Henry returning off injury makes you wonder about how many touches he's going to be getting too. So um, Taney Hill is definitely um, usable. And, uh, and I do have a lot of interest in him and it's a really good matchup. Supposedly Houston's going to come out uh, according to their coach. They don't have anything to play for, but, Coach Speak says they're going to play their starters and try to win this game. If that's the case, then I really like Taney Hill even more. So um, I do have him in my player pool. I used him in my optimizer, and um, and we'll talk about that when we get to the end of the video. Next up, Jamin Winston um, from Tampa Bay. I didn't use too many players from games that don't mean anything, but... Winston has been on a roll lately. Yeah, he's he's turns the ball over a lot, but he gets a lot of yards and touchdowns that covers those mistakes up. He's 6,600. Atlanta has a DVP of number 26 versus the um, quarterback position. 
his floor or his ceiling is really high and so is his floor and I, I like that and I I think the biggest difference in his floor and the ceiling is the turnovers if he doesn't turn it last week I believe he had five turnovers um if he doesn't get them turnovers, then you start getting him more towards the ceiling. I think they're going to come out and try, and try to win this game. It's got This game has the second highest total on the board um, of 48 points. It's in Tampa Bay. They're a two-point favorite. My, or Atlanta's going to come in throwing the ball, and I think Winston will do the uh, same thing. The thing about Winston, though, is he's really, they're really beat up at the wide receiver position. They don't have Mike Evans. They don't have uh, God, Chris Godwin. So it's going to be Perryman and Watson and some guys that you may not be familiar with and his tight ends, OJ Howard and Cameron Brake. But um, his ownership right now is at nine, nine percent. And one quarterback that I have a little interest in that is just playing out the season. Fantastic matchup with the second highest total, and I will have some exposure to him. Next up, Matt Ryan in the, in the game with Jameis Winston. He's $100 cheaper, $6,500. Tampa Bay, $25 versus the um, quarterback position. His ceiling is just a little bit lower than uh, Winston. That's probably because Winston's uh, team is favored at home. His floor is significantly lower, which that's that's a little bit scary. But same situation, he's his ownership's a little bit lower than uh, Winston too, eight percent. Same situation as Winston in a game that means nothing, but players are dedicated to playing for their coach. I was reading something, and um, their coach actually got a new contract, which surprised a lot of people, and a lot of the players were really wanting to go out and and play for their coach and um, go out on the season on a winning note. That's a, that's something else, too. A lot of these teams are playing for pride. If there's players that are banged up, um, coaches probably don't take a, um, a chance with them. But they there was a thing that I read also that says, you know, they're not playing for anything, but they don't have any reason to not play their players. So... I think this game has the potential to really shoot out, and there's going to be some fantasy points that come from this game. Fantastic matchup for Ryan. Tampa Bay, number 25 DVP versus the quarterback, and number 32 versus the wide receiver. And this should be a really nice game for Julio Jones. Daniel Jones, quarterback. Uh, New York Giants, he's 6400 Not crazy about his price, having him up there just 100 less than Ryan and Winston in a game that they're not playing for anything other than to, this is the Giants Super Bowl. They're playing to knock the Eagles out of the playoffs, which will, which will happen um, if the Eagles lose and Dallas wins. Philly has a number 15 ranking versus the quarterback position. Um, Jones has a fairly high ceiling at 29.85. His floor is really ugly, 8.93. His ownership right now was only at 1%. Um, I put some interest here because of narrative, but players are playing for Coach Schirmer. They don't want him fired and would love to knock the Eagles out of the playoffs. This is their Super Bowl. Saquon Barkley's really come on in the last couple weeks. Jones last week um, had a really big game. I believe he had five touchdown uh, passes in that game versus Washington. Philly is coming in beat up. They're at home. I I would be really concerned if I was the Eagles and as beat up as they are again, coming in against this team who has um, been playing really well the last couple of weeks. I have a lot of interest in Jones. I meant to switch him to green, but I was trying to not have too many players in green that aren't really playing for anything. But he is a rookie. They're not going to be taking him out to play Eli. That was a concern I had, too. This if being Eli's farewell, would they pull Jones out? But I read a couple articles. They they want Jones to play. They want him to, um, and they want to beat the Eagles. And it just comes down to that. This is their Super Bowl tomorrow. Under Jones is Dak uh, Prescott from Dallas. He's 6,300. Washington has a 23 DVP versus the Quarterback position, Dak's ceiling is 28.88. Floor, 13.45. You could see a situation if Ezekiel Elliott gets going, that Dak's um, floor would probably be leaning more towards um, 
the floor than the ceiling. But if Washington pushes back, you could see his ceiling being, you know, you could see his numbers being closer to the ceiling or more. It doesn't matter what Philly does if Dallas doesn't win. Dak is banged up with an AC injury, but he doesn't have an injury designation going into tomorrow. Last year, the NFL eliminated the probable tag, so they're either questionable, doubtful, or out. And he doesn't have any um, designation for tomorrow. So, and it says the cow. I put the Cowboys may lean on Zeke versus the Redskins, number 30 DVP versus the running back. So, a little bit concerned about having Dak knowing that the Redskins and the Redskins in the last couple of weeks have just been shredded by the running backs that they've played against. So, um, which was Barkley and I believe Sanders um, shredded them. So, not sure Dak will have to do a lot. And I, I'll have some exposure to him in the. Because this is a playoff game for them. It doesn't matter what Philadelphia does. If they don't win, it doesn't matter what um, Dallas does. But that's the only way they get in is if they win and Philly loses. Next is Carson Wentz. He's 6,100. 6, Giants are 29 versus the quarterback position. He has a ceiling of 24.63 and a floor of 12.73. His numbers are a little bit lower because his wide receiver core are absolutely beat up. They're using a fifth string wide receiver. Their number one wide receiver tomorrow is Greg Ward, who's a converted college quarterback. Um, and Zach Ertz has been ruled out, his number one target. So they got a lot going against them. They are going to get running back Jordan Howard back tomorrow. But I think that the Giants are going to come out and throw the ball around and try to beat him, which is going to force him to throw the ball too. He's just got some targets that aren't, um, um, well, they're not as good as the uh, Giants' targets. Um, Must-win situation. Dallas plays at the same time. Really beat up a wide receiver position, which is led by Greg Ward, converted college quarterback. And I had initially in in here, Zach Ertz was very questionable. He has been ruled out. Tom Brady, 6,000, playing against Miami, who has a number 31 DVP versus the quarterback position. <clears throat> Ceiling 22.57 and floor 9.99. They clinch a first-round bye with a win or a Kansas City loss. They're not going to be dependent on Kansas City to lose. They're going to come out and try to put it on Miami. Won't be able to scoreboard watch as Kansas, play, Kansas City plays at 1 o'clock. Also, um, they may not have to ma- pass much versus... Uh, Miami, though, because of their horrible rush defense. And that's what a lot of these top quarterbacks in these games that they're playing for something, all of them may be able to just lean on their running games. Um, and, you know, you can beat Miami in a multitude of ways, but I just have a sneaky feeling that tomorrow is going to be a really <clears throat> good game for Sonny Michelle. So, I would be leaning more towards, you know, the teens and you need 18 to, just to get the low value for Brady. And I'm not sure you get there if the running game gets going in there and their defense. If their defense gets gets going as they have done in a few games, then Brady doesn't get anywhere near these uh, this number because he doesn't have to. Last in my quarterback pool is Phillip Rivers. <clears throat> He's 5,400 playing against um, Houston, or Kansas City, who has a number 12 DVP versus the quarterback position. Has a ceiling of 22.61 and a floor of 11.74. This could be Rivers' final game for the Chargers. Kansas City could be resting some players, especially later in the game. Chargers will try to win this game. I love the price for the value. It doesn't take much to get value for that um, for Rivers. 16 points to get to the low value can see a situation late in the game if they're playing from behind which they're projected to be doing that he um, puts together some fantasy um, garbage points and can get up to that ceiling I, I think I really think he gets there tomorrow I have a lot of interest in rivers in this game um, it doesn't mean anything to him with this potentially being his last game in, in um LA, um, I think that he's going to come out throwing the ball and they're going to try to beat the, the Chiefs. They, um, they're not going to lay down. A lot of teams want to end their season on a win 
and at his price, I and his ownership, his ownership uh, is only one percent. Also, Daniel Jones' ownership, right projected ownership right now is only one percent too. So I have a lot of interest in both those quarterbacks. Let's drop down here to the uh, excuse me, the running backs. Obviously, at the top, ten thousand dollars, Christian McCaffrey. I'm going to have a lot of McCaffrey. His ceiling is thirty-seven point thirty-six. His floor is 23.4. I mean, he almost, you need 30 points. And I feel like I'm locking in 30 points with him every week. He carried, he carried my season long team and um, I bet against him one time and it, and it cost me dearly this year. I thought I was uh, being smart by fading him in the Jacksonville game, which just happened to be the game that he scored the most points. Um, his ownership is up there, but it's not the the highest, which um, that might make him a little bit contrarian too with some of these other running backs uh, being higher owned. But I did want to mention this note in case some of you haven't seen this. Um, his offensive coordinator said, I will get McCaffrey the ball any way I can this weekend. He needs 216 total yards for the yards from scrimmage record. And he needs 67 receiving yards to be the third player in NFL history to have 1,000 yards receiving and 1,000 yard rushing in the same season. He is going to get a ton of work tomorrow. It doesn't matter if they're winning. It doesn't matter if they're losing. He's matchup proof. He catches a lot of passes out of the backfield, which if this game goes the way it's supposed to go with New Orleans being a double-digit favorite, I believe, you know, they're favored by 13 in Carolina with a rookie quarterback. He got targeted a ton by the um, by Greyer last week. And um, I, I think he gets there. I just like, I like locking in that 30 points. It's expensive, but I feel like I'm getting two players for one. He's a running back and he's a wide receiver at 10,000. So I'm playing 5,000 for each of them. And it just makes sense. And I will be building a lot of my lineups around him. He is in a darker green than all the others. I have a lot of interest in McCaffrey tomorrow. Saquon Barkley is 8,700. Um, Eagles are number seven versus the running back position. He has a fairly high floor, 31.39. Really, there's a big gap there in his uh, 31.39 on his ceiling, 6.41 in his floor. There's a big gap there. And if the passing game gets going with Jones in a shootout, I mean, he'll probably get some, well, he will get a lot of points through the um, passing game um, in that scenario. But I think I kind of like to pivot away from Barkley this week because I think he'll be chalky because of recency bias. He's had two weeks in a row where he's had just really big games. Uh, his ownership is it's lower, 7% right now. And, um, which make that alone, and I'll check that again later in the day, that alone would make him more contrarian, but he's averaged 28.93 fantasy points per game in the games he's played against Philadelphia in his short two year career has scored 33 and 46 points in the last two games, um, versus Miami and Washington. The only thing about uh, Barkley is you've got to make a choice between McCaffrey and Barkley. It's be difficult to get both of them in the same lineup. Um, I th think this is a really good matchup, but I do like the Giants passing game a little bit more as a pivot away from him. Next is Aaron Jones for Green Bay. He's 8,200. Um, Detroit, number 29 versus running back position. He has a ceiling of 33.23. A floor of 6.23, and I think that would that number is there because um, Jamal Williams vultures, you know, some of his carries. Um, but he has had some really big games in the games that Williams has been out when it's just been him. And I put here, Williams is expected to be ruled out, giving all the touches to Joan versus Detroit's number 29 DVP versus running back. Could be a nice pivot off of Rodgers in the passing game. And I was talking about that up here, you know, obviously big favorite. Um, a lot of ownerships is going to go to Rogers and Devontae Adams, but the way to go might be Aaron Jones and the green Bay defense playing against the rookie quarterback. And that might be the smarter move. Um, again, it'd be hard to get McCaffrey and Jones, but I will have, when I don't have McCaffrey, I'm going to have um, Aaron Jones in, in those lineups. 
Next up, Derrick Henry is 8,100. Houston has a 24 DVP versus the running back position. He has a fairly high ceiling at 30.57. His floor is 9.59. That's similar to the um, they played a few weeks ago, and he had 86 yards rushing and no touchdowns. So that's close to that floor there, and um, and that's what I had here too. Uh, 86 yards, no TDs in Week 15 matchup versus Houston. Houston, but Tennessee needs to win to get in. Houston's allowing 102.6 yards rushing per game in their last nine games. Ideally, that's what Tennessee would love to do is control this game. If Houston, for whatever reason, plays their starters, um, you know, keep Watson on the sideline, and you can do that by giving the ball to Derrick Henry. Next up, Ezekiel Elliott. I have him in the same green as McCaffrey. Um, when I don't get up to McCaffrey, I'm probably going to try to get to um, Zeke. Got a ceiling of 28.82, a nice floor of 14.06. Really high ownership, though, 20%. Um, one of the top three. It's, he's tied with Alvin Kamara, actually. With Dak injured, the Cowboys will probably lean on Zeke. Washington allows 128.6 yards per game in their last nine games. Elliott has averaged 21.33 fantasy points per game in six games versus Washington. Washington has a number 30 DVP versus the running back. I, I really like Ezekiel Elliott at that price. Really good matchup. Must win. Just checks all the boxes, and I will have some exposure to him. Next up, Alvin Kamara from New Orleans. He's 7,800. Um, Carolina, the worst versus the running back position, number 32. His his ceiling is what concerns me. With that salary and that ceiling, that's not cutting it because you need 23 points for uh, value. Now, he could get that. and so Anything could happen. He could get that and smash. But he does split some carries with Murray. He gets a lot of his through the passing game. So with Kamara, you need McCaffrey and the Carolina Panthers to be pushing them and it's just I, I don't like that price and looking at that ceiling uh, it is a fantastic matchup as Carolina's number 32 DVP versus running back and they've allowed 150.4 rushing yards per game their last nine game I'm concerned that Murray could be more involved in this game New, New Orleans needs to win for a first round bye and they could be scoreboard, scoreboard watching a little bit, too, because they play at the same time as Green Bay. So it looks like Green Bay is going to um, put um, Detroit away. Sean Payton might pull his players because they'll have to play next week. Next up, Nick Chubb. I don't have him highlighted at all. I just have a little bit of interest. He's 7,500. Um, Cincinnati, number 26, DVP. He has a nice ceiling. Um, and the floor is scary. Good matchup, but not sure what to expect in a game with no meaning. Not sure the volume will be there, especially with Kareem Hunt in the picture. Hunt's been getting a lot of the passes out of the backfield, and Chubb's touches have went down significantly since Kareem Hunt has joined the team. His division rivals in Cincinnati. Um, both teams want to win this game, and um, he'll be involved. I'm just worried about... Um, how much he's going to be involved in. I don't think, I think it'd be difficult for him to get value. His ceiling is 26.07. I just think it's going to be hard for him to get um, value with um, Kareem Hunt involved. Joe Mixon, Cincinnati 7,200. Um, Cleveland number 22 DVP versus the running back position. He has a ceiling of 22.9, a floor 8.06. He's had 23, 25, and 21 carries in his last three games. And um, in his last game versus Cleveland a few weeks ago, he had 23 carries, 146 yards, and a TD with three receptions and 40 yards receiving in week 14 loss to Cleveland. He's averaging 20.97 fantasy points per game versus Cleveland in the five games. The only thing about Mixon is that price just keeps me away. Um he is the lead back there, and um, this could potentially be Andy Dalton's last game in Cincinnati too. And I think I think the Bengals are going to come out. They'll probably they will try to establish the run with Mixon, but I think some of the passing game is going to take away from Mixon. Last week they had that wide receiver Ross get 13 targets in that game. 
And I think they might go back to that. And they will definitely, if somehow Cleveland gets out a lead on them, they're not just going to roll over there to, you know, to game script would favor the passing game for Cincinnati. So I'm going to limit my exposure to Mixon. He's somewhat interesting due to the number of carries he's had in the last three games. Um, but I, I just, why I don't have him in green or yellow. Leonard for he's quite, has a questionable tag in these number 10 versus running back. He does. He is averaging 22.8 touches per game. He's getting targeted out of the backfield. They're not playing for anything. He's 7,000. His floor is 24.72. Indy's number eight versus the running back position. Um, floor is 9.86. He's got really high ownership, 17. I, I just, I have him in here. I, I Again, I don't have him color-coded. I probably won't get to Leonard Fournette. If I can get to the 7,000, I'm probably going to try to, figure out how to get up to Kamara or Elliott. Um, he does get a lot of the touches. He's a little banged up, which worries me. You know, last game of the year, which the coach going to chance it, and then they have that Raquel Armstead that I'm sure they'd like to get a look at as well. Miles Sanders from Philadelphia, 6,800. Um, Giants are number 13 versus the running back position. He has a ceiling of 26.94 and a floor of 7.66. Howard is due back. Um, so he's going to take some of those touches away from Sanders. Sanders will still head the backfield in a must-win game. Um, but they're down to their fifth-string wide receivers, and Zach Ertz is out. So Sanders could be involved heavily, but like I said, Howard is back, and, and he will be playing, and that will take away some of the touches from him. And I don't think – I think it will be really difficult to get value with him at 6,800. I don't, I don't like that price at all with Howard being back. Devontae Freeman from Atlanta. Tampa Bay is real stingy versus the run. He does catch his passes out of the backfield. He's number three DVP versus Tampa Bay's defense. Um, Tampa Bay has a DVP at number three versus the running back. I'm sorry. He has a really high floor, 25.01, and or ceiling at 25.04, and a floor of 7.65. He had nine receptions for 74 yards and 53 rushings and two TDs in, in his game last week versus Jacksonville. But Tampa, Tampa Bay stingy versus the run, number four overall, and his price is going to drive his ownership down. Coming off that big game last week, his ownership's only five percent right now. So he might be a nice contrarian move off of it if you go with the um, Tampa Bay passing game and then pivot off of the Atlanta receivers and go to maybe him in some type of game stack. Austin Eckler for the Chargers. He's 6,200. The Chiefs, they're no 28 DVP versus the um, running back position. He has a floor 26, or ceiling of 26.54, a floor of 8.22. Got really low ownership right now, only 1%. He had eight receptions for 108 yards in the week 11 loss to um, Kansas City. And pass catching running backs do give Kansas City trouble. You still have gulturing. Gordon vulturing snaps and TDs, which um, limits your expectations for him. I kind of like that price for him, though, and I have a lot of interest. Um, we had him in yellow, and that's because they're not really playing for anything. And um, But it's a really good matchup, and I'll have some exposure to Austin Eckler. Under Eckler is Gordon. He's $200 cheaper, um, 28 Kansas City's 28 DVP versus the running back position. He's got a fairly low ceiling of 21.8 points and floor of 9.116. Got low ownership of 3%. Kansas City's number 28 versus the run, but you have to factor in Eckler and his snap percentage. So I, I don't like running back committees. Eckler has been getting it done. And in this type of game script, if they're going to be playing from behind, which Kansas City is a eight point home favorite. So they're going to have to pass to get back in the game. If this could be, um, where you want to go is with Austin Eckler. If the Chargers able to stay in the game, get a lead, then you might want to consider, uh, if they believe in that game script, then you might want to consider Melvin Gordon.
and a floor of 4.7, which is scary. He's got 5% ownership. He gets a lot of targets out of the backfield. New England is in a must-win situation to gain a playoff bye. And I look for the New, New England running backs to have a good game versus the Miami rush defense. I think it's gonna, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be the Sonny Michelle and James White, and that's how they're going to get it done with their defense tomorrow. 5,900, I, I like that. But I, actually, down here, Michelle, I like even more. Le'Veon Bell, Jets, he's 5,800. Gets a ton of targets every game. Um, Pitt, or the Jets are playing, I'm sorry, Buffalo. And Buffalo's expected to, their coach said they're going to play some of their players, but he's not sure how long because they do have to play next weekend. Um, Buffalo has a number 13 DVP versus the um, running back position because they're super stingy and good versus wide receivers. He Bell has a ceiling of 17.24 with a uh, floor of 9.18. He's getting 20.8 touches per game. And he does so he doesn't need much to get value in a game that Buffalo's not playing for anything. And I think Bell gets there. I have a lot of interest in him at that price. And I think he gets there, and that's what I'm looking for is value. And with that many touches for game, the last game of the season, um, they're not playing for anything, but the Jets are playing for pride. I, I have a lot of interest in him at that price. It's difficult to find running backs that get that many touches at that price. Latavius Murray for New Orleans. He's 5,600 versus Carolina's number 32 DVP versus the running back position. He has a ceiling of 25.74 and a floor of 0.28. That's super scary. Interesting pivot off of Kamara versus Carolina's 32 de rush defense. Kamara does most of his damage in the passing game. Um, the thing about Murray, as I mentioned, that floor is really scary. But I think New Orleans is going to try to get the run game going against Carolina because that's where their weakness is. And I think it'll be Kamara and um, Murray. He, I don't know that he gets value splitting touches with um, Kamara. And Kamara gets a lot of the passing work. Um, so with Murray, you're looking at needing him to get in the end zone a couple times um, probably to get value. I don't see a 100-yard game in this for him, but I think Murray and um, Kamara will be widely used and I might pivot off of Kamara some to, and get, and have my exposure to Murray. He's uh, he got 3% ownership right now, projected ownership, and that's fairly low. Under Murray is Sonny Michelle from New England. I was talking about him when we were talking about uh, James White. He's only 4,900 uh, Miami. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Miami number 26 DVP versus the running back position. He has a ceiling of 14.67 and a floor of 3.49. 6% ownership. Um, I have a lot of interest in the New England running backs versus Miami defense. Miami Miami is allowing 109 yards a game their last nine, and nine games, and it does not take much to get value for him at 4,900. I think they're going to get give him the ball. I think he's going to get a lot of touches, upwards to 20 or more touches in this game. And I'm, I'm going to be having Michelle in a lot of my lineups. Um, this allows me to spend up at other places, and I feel like I, it won't take much for him to get value. And I think 100 yards and a touchdown is um, doable for Michelle or, or more. Ronald Jones from Tampa Bay. He's the same price as Sony Michelle. Going against Atlanta, number 12 DVP versus the running back position. He has a ceiling of 18.04, a floor of 3.68. He's had double-digit carries in three straight games, um, and I like using him as a part of a game stack with the Ryan passing game. Where I was talking about Freeman going stacking with the Tampa Bay passing game, I like using Jones and stacking with the Atlanta uh, passing game. So I have some interest in him as a, as a stacking piece, and I'll have some exposure. His exposure, his um, ownership is only 2%, and he might be a nice pivot away from Winston and Perryman in the passing game. Gus Edwards for Baltimore. He's 4,800. He's supposed to leave the backfield tomorrow. As the Ravens are resting a lot of their starters, including Lamar Jackson and, and Mark Ingram. 
He has a ceiling 11.25 and a floor of 0.75. Cheap option with the Ravens resting Jackson and Ingram and other starters. Edwards could get a huge volume. And he, last week he did out-touch um, Justice Hill 13-6. to six. So I got a lot of interest in Edwards tomorrow in a game that Pittsburgh is going to have to win. And Baltimore is just trying to get out of it um, healthy. I'm sure they would not like to knock Pittsburgh out of the playoffs. So. Damian Williams for Kansas City is 4,700. Chargers number 20 DVP versus the running back position. He has a ceiling of 18.18, a floor of 4.56, 10% ownership. This is the pivot off the Kansas City passing game and the way you attack the Chargers, who are 21st overall versus the run. I really like Damian Williams tomorrow at that price. I think they're going to give him a ton of carries. And um, I really like him and um, Sonny Michelle this week at these um, at these prices and getting a lot of touches. Carry on Johnson from Detroit is 4,500. First game back was last week. Green Bay's number 24 DVP versus the um, running back position. He has a 19.8 ceiling, a 5.94 floor. He's got really low ownership, 1%. He could get a lot of volume and targets out of the backfield in a game that they should be playing from behind. This is an extreme value play, and I have some interest in him, and I think he'll get the majority of the carries, and he, he'll get targeted a lot out of the backfield. You just have to be concerned that they're, you know, obviously starting a rookie quarterback in David Blow. But they should be playing from behind, and if they get him and Johnson involved in the passing game, shouldn't be too hard for him to get value at $4,500. Raquel Armstead from Jacksonville, he's interesting only if Leonard Fournette has been ruled out at 4,400. As we mentioned, Indianapolis has an 8 DVP versus the running back position, 5.18 ceiling, uh, floor of zero. Obviously, if he doesn't play, he could replace Fournette, and you have to consider 4,400 for a lead back as a cheat code. So keep an eye on the um, injury report. If you see that Fournette's going to be out, this might be an interesting uh, play right here. Frank Gore for Buffalo's 4,000. The Jets are number 10 versus the running back position. He has a ceiling of 6.84, a floor of 1.48, only 2% ownership. He could get a large snap percentage with players potentially not playing or having pl- uh, limited playing time. So if they're going to sit... Singletary, or if Singletary is not going to get um, much playing time tomorrow, Frank Gore could get probably a ton of carries. And it doesn't take much, you know, for him to get, doesn't necessarily take 100 yards for him to get um, value if he, you know, falls into the end zone, 4,000, you know, maybe a couple passes or 50 yards rushing or something to pay off value. Um And last, Malcolm Brown, same situation as uh, Arm said, could replace Gurley as uh, Coach McVay has hinted that some players may be held out to avoid further injury. And in that in that press conference, he also mentioned Gurley. So keep an eye on that. Malcolm Brown would be a nice pickup if the um, Rams decide to sit Todd Gurley. So that's the running backs. And now I'm going to I'm going to scroll up here. Hopefully you had a chance to screenshot that if you were interested in having it, that information. I'll take a drink real quick. Okay. Next is tight ends. Uh, tra- Travis Kelsey, he's 7,000. His uh, Chargers have a number nine DVP versus the tight end position. He has a ceiling of 23.02 points and a floor 11.98. He's obviously the, obviously the top option at tight end. His ownership is uh, projected at 13% right now. But as I mentioned earlier in this video and when we talked about Mahomes, uh, I'm worried that Reed will pull his starters if New England plays pulls away from Miami. Um, and the running game is the best way to attack the Chargers. Not sure that Kelsey has a really big game in this game. And um, uh, I feel like I can spin down in the, in the tight end position this week and so that I can spend up in other areas. I, I don't think I'll get up to Kelsey at all. And um, his, uh, his ownership numbers are actually projected to be pretty high con- in comparison to the rest. Austin Hooper for um, Atlanta. 
I just didn't get a chance to highlight this one, but I'm going to highlight it in, in uh, yellow as well. He's 5,800. Tampa Bay has a 26 DVP versus the tight end position. He's got a ceiling of 21.01 points. 5.21 is his floor. 6% ownership right now. Gets a large target share. 7.3 targets per game. Second highest total on the board. No Calvin Ridley. Defi definitely a stacking piece that I will utilize. Tyler Higby from the Rams. He's 5,600. This is the cheat code. I've done this all season, and it's worked out fairly well as you play the, the tight end that's playing against Arizona. Um, Arizona's number 32 versus the tight end position. He has a ceiling of 22.34 points and a floor of 2.82. And a 6% ownership. Like I said, he's, this is the cheat code, um, which is Arizona's there. Number 32 DVP versus the tight end position. His price has really went up, and I'm not crazy about this in a game that has no meaning, and golf may not be play or be limited. So if I got to Higby, I would probably be getting going on up to Hooper. Or, you know, I'm just not sure how the Rams are going to approach this game. If golf doesn't play a lot, then you have Bortles. You know, golf had a good um, rapport with Higby. But if Bortles gets some playing time, I just don't know what to expect out of Higby at 5,600. So it might be difficult for him to get um, to value. It is a fantastic matchup, though. Darren Waller for Oakland, he's 5,400. Denver's number 13, DVP versus the tight end position. He's got a ceiling of 22.78, a floor of 5.38. Denver has allowed 64.6 .6 yards per game to the tight end in their last nine game. Oakland has has to win to have any chance at the playoffs. Um, it's a slim chance, but if they don't win, none of the rest of it matters anyway. And he's one of the top targets for Carr. So I have a little bit of interest in him. I think it's a really difficult matchup versus Denver, though. Jared Cook, tight end for New Orleans. He's 5,200. Carolina's number two versus the tight end position. He has a ceiling of 19.86, a floor of 8.78. New Orleans is going to be playing to win as they can get a first-round bye with a win. Um, his floor is the second highest over here, which is really interesting. Um Sometimes you focus on the floor more than you do the ceiling. You know, you get a high floor like that, it makes him, a, you know, a safe option or projected to be a safe option. I'm not sure how much of Jared Cook I'm going to have, though. As I said, I'm really interested in the New Orleans running game versus Carolina. Um, but the running game could open up a few possibilities for Cook. You just need Carolina to be pushing back and doing some scoring for pieces of that passing game to be relevant. Dallas Goddard for Tennessee's, uh, or tight end for Philadelphia. He's 4,900. Giants are number 13 versus the tight end position. He has a floor or ceiling of 16.77 and a floor of 7.41. Ceiling and floor will be higher as Ertz has been ruled out. Goddard had his best game of, of the year last week versus Dallas. He had nine receptions on 12 targets. For 91 yards and a touchdown, ceiling could be huge in this game where it's a must win. They're really beat up at wide receiver. This could be a really big game for Dallas Goddard. I will have some exposure to him. Hunter Henry for the Chargers. He's 4,500. He just he has as much upside as all the other tight ends. Um, Kansas City's number 23 DVP versus the tight end position. He has a ceiling of 20.85, a floor of 4.95. Fairly low ownership, too, at 4%. Expected to be playing from behind in a game that could be Phillip Rivers' last game. I feel like Hunter Henry is definitely underpriced. O.J. Howard, um, tight end for Tampa Bay. He's 4,300. Um, Atlanta is number 17 DVP versus the tight end position. He has a ceiling 11.37 and a floor 2.45. This is the second highest total on the board in a game that has no meaning. Tampa Bay has a depleted wide receiver group, could receive a huge target share, and I think this game could possibly shoot out. So I do, I definitely have some interest in Howard at that price, and I'll have some exposure to him. Janu Smith from Tennessee, he's 4,200. He, um, Houston is number 21 DVP versus the, wide, or versus the tight end position. He has a ceiling of 15.39 and a floor of 2.43. 
He's got really low ownership at 3%. Part of a must-win stack with uh, Tannehill. What's really weird about uh, Janu Smith is not too long ago, this guy was $2,500, and now he's burst onto the scene with Delaney Walker gone, and uh, he's all the way up to 4200 And um, I think he can get there in a game, if, especially if Houston's going to try to win. Um, if you're interested in the Tennessee passing game, you obviously want to have some exposure to him. Jason Winton for uh, tight end for Dallas. He's 3,900. Washington's number 30 DVP versus the tight end position. He has a ceiling of 13.93 and a floor of 3.91. Looks like really owner projected low projected ownership at 2%. This could be Winton's last game as a Cowboy. Um, the Cowboys need to win and a Philly loss to the Giants. Um, I think they're going to lean on Zeke with Dak being injured. Witten is also one touchdown from breaking um, Des Bryant's all-time touchdown record for the Cowboys. So I don't know if they'll try to get get it to him, but if they get down near near the um, goal line um, inside the red zone, you could see him taking a couple shots to Witten to give him get get him that record. But I think the main thing for the Cowboys right now too is make sure we win this game just in case the Eagles um, fall to the Giants. Caden Smith for the Giants. He's 3,700. I have a lot of interest in um, Caden Smith as part of the stack with uh, Jones and some other pass catchers from the Giants. Philly's number two uh, DVP versus the tight end position. He's got a ceiling of 16.59 and a floor of 2.74. Really low ownership at 1% right now. Projected ownership. Six receptions, 35 yards, and two touchdowns last week on eight targets. And that was Jones' first game back. The Giants are going to try to knock the depleted Eagles out of the playoffs. I really like Caden Smith stacked up with Daniel Jones and another pass catcher and then bringing it back with um, like Dallas Goddard or something like that um, from Philadelphia. I like stacking that game a lot. Cameron Brate from Tampa Bay. He's 3,200. He has a seven. Uh, Atlanta has 17 DVP versus. Um, tight end position, he has a ceiling of 13.18, which is actually higher than Howard's, and a floor that's lower than Howard's of 1.9. He could be the pivot off a higher-owned Howard, who's he's sitting right now at 7% in a potentially high-scoring game. So I'll have some exposure to him in my Tampa Bay and Atlanta stacks. Next up is the wide receivers. I'm going to scroll up a little bit. Hopefully you guys have been able to screenshot some of this. If not, pause. you can pause the video and go back and get some of this information. Um, Michael Thomas, uh, obviously matchup proof. He's 9900 I don't like that price because now that's Christian McCaffrey price. And how much are the Saints going to have to do against um, Carolina? Is he going to get... You need 30 point, 20, or yeah, 30 points out of him for value. And uh, game script might not favor for him. I mean, his ceiling is really nice at 34.75. His floor is definitely nice at night. His floor obviously doesn't pay off that 9900 but $1,000 less than McCaffrey. His ownership's at 12%. Now, Carolina does have a DVP of 25 versus the wide receiver position position he's getting 11.8 targets per game safe floor but you need 30 as i mentioned you need 30 points for low value good but not great matchup on the road i'm not sure i'm going to get there um, new orleans does need this game for a first round buy but i think they can get there in their running game he's going to get some but i don't think it's he's already set the record for receptions in a season he just last week just broke Marvin Harrison's record. So I don't know how much they have to use Michael Thomas. And if they're not going to get the first round by, which they play at the same time as Green Bay, are they going to chance just running him out there for the fun of it to just target him over and over? Uh, I just don't know that I'll get up to there. And my thoughts may be what a lot of people have, which might make him contrarian and pivot off of McCaffrey and go to him and hope that um, he outscores McCaffrey. That's that's kind of the choice you have. And um, I just don't know that I'll get to him that much. 
Julio Jones for Atlanta is 8,500. Um, Tampa Bay, number 32 DVP versus wide receiver position. He has a ceiling of 29.5, a floor of 9. I really like the matchup. It's fantastic on paper. Tampa Bay is number 32 versus the wide receiver position. This game could shoot out, as I've mentioned um, numerous times. The floor is scary, but there's no Calvin Ridley, and, and that'll help the target share as well. You have Gage and you have Hooper who'll get some targets. This could be a really big game for Julio Jones. It's a really good matchup. I was looking at um, my um, wide receiver matchups. He actually, yeah, yeah, he wasn't on the list. I'm going to go over that list with you guys here shortly. But I, I do have some interest with him, obviously, stacked up with Matt Ryan, um, Hooper, pieces of the Tampa Bay offense as well. It's just really scary in games that don't mean anything, especially when you're how are they going to go all out? You need him to go all out at 8,500. Devontae Adams for um, Green Bay, he's 8,000. Um, Detroit, number 29 DVP versus the wide receiver position. He'll get matched up against Darius Slay in this game. He's got a 27.34 ceiling with a 12.42 floor. Green Bay needs this game for potentially the top spot in the NFC. Detroit, number 29 versus wide receiver. The, this is a phenomenal matchup. Uh, he's going to probably see double-digit targets. But if they get that running game going and they can put them away with the running game and flex on the Lions with their defense using a rookie quarterback, this is a similar to Michael Thomas. How much, how much does he have to do in this game, you know? Of course, if they're playing, trying to get home field advantage throughout the playoffs, they won't be playing for a couple weeks. Um, but I, I think the, the the Green Bay running game is going to be the biggest part of this game, and I'm not sure how much Devontae Adams will actually have to do. And he, I mean, Darius Slay's not shut down, but he's the best corner they have, and he'll he'll be um, drawing some coverage on uh, Devontae Adams. DeAndre Hopkins, Houston. I don't even have him highlighted. Um, the coach speak is that they're going to play. They're going to play their starters, and it just it makes zero sense because they're not playing for anything. Um, he's seventeen hundred DVP of twenty. He's got a ceiling of twenty seven point two two, a floor of thirteen point seven five. I mean, I put six percent ownership. Not. So and at seventy eight hundred, he hasn't been that low all year. So that's it is a good price if he's going to be playing. I'm just not sure how much the Texans will play their starters if at all. Nothing to gain gain except an injury. Can't pay seventy eight hundred for low volume, even though he's priced down. That's you know, but he could be contrarian if they really do come out and he and um, the coach plays the starter. Um, that knowing that you're going to play next weekend, no matter what, this is, I wouldn't want to play my players. And that's how I'm looking at it. If he does play, how much will he play? Can he play? Can he pay off the 23 points, 24 points that you need just for low value? I'm just, I don't know that he gets there in this situation. Tyree kill from Kansas city. He's 7,700. Chargers are a difficult matchup. They're number three DVP versus the wide receiver position. He has a ceiling of 28.02 and a floor of eight. Difficult matchup versus the Chargers. Kansas City may find it easier to move the ball on the ground, which supports a large favorite home game. So I I probably have very limited exposure to Tyreek Hill. They are playing at home. They are playing somewhat um, for first round by, but they also need to depend on New England to get beat by Miami. And the reality of that is that is probably not going to happen in Miami or in New England. So I won't have much exposure to him. He does have 8% projected ownership right now. So it's a lot higher than I expected. And at his, I just not crazy about his price in a game that might be dominated by the running game. Julian Edelman for New England, 7,300. Number 30 DVP versus the um, Miami. Miami has a number 30 DVP versus the wide receiver position. He's got a ceiling of 24.99 and a floor of 11.19. I 
nine percent ownership. If I use um, Edelman, I'm definitely going to, or Brady, I'm definitely going to be using Edelman. New England needs a win to clinch first round by or a Kansas City loss. They do play at the same time. He's getting nine point eight targets per game, and I th- think he'll be involved. He'll definitely be involved if Miami's able to keep the game close and score a little bit. I do think New England tries to establish the run and utilize Michelle and White and Burkhead and those guys and and use their defense to flex on Miami. So I'll use Edelman um, strictly for when I'm going to have Brady I'll stack him up, and, and that's where I'll have my exposure to him. A.J. Brown for Tennessee, 7,000. Houston has 19 DVP versus the um, tight end or wide receiver position. He has a ceiling of 26.19, a floor of 4.75. He had eight receptions, 114 yards, and one TD on 13 targets in a week 15 game, which was just two weeks ago versus Houston. Tennessee's in a must-win situation to get in, um, to get in the playoffs. I do like A.J. Brown. I obviously would use him with Taney Hill, not I don't think I'll use A.J. Brown and Derrick Henry. They're, they have a negative effect on each other. Um, but if Houston comes out and tries to um, win or push back or play their starters, I think A.J. Brown is the one that has the big game with T- Tanny Hill. So I really will. His ownership's only 4% projected ownership right now, and that's affected by Derrick Henry returning. So this might be the pivot away from... Uh, Derrick Henry. Rashad Perryman for Tampa Bay, 6,700. Atlanta's number 16 DVP versus the wide receiver position. He's got a ceiling of 22.44 and a floor of 0.32. Let's hope that don't happen. Has 9% ownership. He is the de facto number one wide receiver for Tampa Bay in a game that has shootout potential but has absolutely no meaning. He's priced up from $3,700. In, in week 14, he was $3,700. Now he's $6,700. And just three weeks later, he will get the targets. His sh- his floor should be higher, though. He's going to get some uh, targets. And uh, if this game gets going back and forth and the, and it shoots out, you can see him um, getting value easily. Amari Cooper for Dallas. I got him in yellow. Um I think Dallas is going to lean on Zeke with um, Dak being injured. Plus, Washington has uh, given up a lot the last couple weeks to the running back position. He's 6,500. Um, Washington has a DVP of 15 versus the wide receiver position. He's got a ceiling of 22.95 and a floor of 2.15. Um, Ellie is, is getting a lot of the attention, and Cooper could go overlooked in a game that the Cowboys have to win to even have a chance to get in the playoff. Dak is the injury concern. If it looks like all the ownership's going to go to Elliott, which he does have higher ownership, and you see Cooper sitting here um, at half the ownership, so the contrarian move might be to go to the Dallas passing game and pivot off of Zeke, even though I think they will try to get Zeke going and um, win the game that way. Cortland Sutton for Denver, he's 6,400. Um, Oakland has a DVP of 21 versus wide receiver position. He's 19.05 ceiling, 7.37 floor, really low ownership at 2%. He's had seven red zone targets in the last three games, 20 targets in the last two games. Favorite target of the rookie quarterback, Locke. He could go under own and be very sneaky. They're letting their rookie quarterback play tomorrow. They want to knock Oakland out of the playoffs. This is a really sneaky um, wide receiver that you could use um, potentially as a one-off. And um, Locke likes going to him, and he's got real low ownership, which I like too. And he's like he's had seven red zone targets in the last three games, so I really like that. They're going to let the rookie come out and throw the ball and um, try to knock the Raiders. If the Raiders don't win, none of those other scenarios matter anyhow. So... Um, I look for Denver to come out and um, play really well in this game versus the Raiders. Sterling Shepard for the Giants, 6,200. Philly has a 28 DVP versus the wide receiver position. He's 21.97 um, ceiling, 8.13 floor. 
I will have, um, I'll probably be above this 3% projected ownership as stacking with um, Daniel Jones. Philly's pass defense allows a lot of production to the wide receiver, number 28 DVP, allowing 41.4 fantasy points per game to the wide receiver. I like the Giants passing game as a pivot away from the more popular Saquon Barkley, a lot of recency bias for the games that he's had. So I think this, I mean, this is obviously a huge game for Philadelphia, and I think the Giants are going to come out and try to throw the ball uh, in this one. I have a lot of interest in Sterling Shepard. Keenan Allen from the Chargers, 6,100. Um, Chiefs have a number two DVP versus the wide receiver position. He's got a ceiling of 18.51 and a floor of 8.49. 5% ownership. I really like Allen. It's his price. Projected to be playing from behind. Could potentially be Rivers' last game. And he's had averaged 24.45 fantasy points per game in six games for his Kansas City. So I really like Keenan Allen as a stack piece with Phillip Rivers. Jarvis Landry from uh, Cleveland. He does have a questionable tag. He's 5,900. Uh, Cincinnati number 10 DVP versus wide receiver position. He has a ceiling of 25.35 and a floor of 6.83. His ownership sit, sitting at 6% right now. He's getting a ton of targets. He's had 47 targets in the last five games. Could be sneaky if Beckham Jr. is ruled out for any reason. He's a little bit banged up, but I've seen that he, he was, um, I think they got rid of the, um, injury designation, but make sure you check the injuries. I, if Beckham was out, I would definitely have a lot more interest in Landry. Um, his price has dropped significantly. It was just two weeks ago. It was 6,700 and he's still getting a large uh, share of the targets. So, um, he can probably get there and get value at that 5,900, you know, the targets that target shares that he's getting. And I think they'll let Mayfield throw the ball tomorrow. It's just, I don't know how, it's really difficult to project a game where they're not playing for anything. It's like a preseason approach. And um, But I, I do have some interest in Landry. Golden Tate from the Giants. He's 5,100. Philly, number 28 DVP versus wide receiver. He's averaging 20 point, or he has a ceiling of 20.85 20 fantasy points, a floor of 6.83. Fairly low ownership at 3%. He's had uh, 11 targets in Jones' first game back last week. Philly's number 28 DVP versus wide receiver. I'm stacking this game. And as I just mentioned about Shepard, this is a nice pivot off of the Barkley, Barkley um, due to recency bias. And I think Jones is gonna, Jones could potentially have a really big game in this one if, Houston, or if uh, Philadelphia's scoring some points and they're scoring some points. And the Giants have really been playing well the last few weeks and putting up a lot of points. Philly's going to have to put up some points to, to beat them. And I think this game has the potential to shoot out. The The game total is only 45. Philly's a four-point favorite going into the Giants. Next up is uh, Justin Watson, 4,900. Um Atlanta number 16 DVP versus the wide receiver position. He has a 10.09 ceiling, a zero floor. He's the number two wide receiver in a pass half of the offense in a game with um, shootout potential. Potential Definitely a stack piece. Steven Sims Jr., wide receiver Washington. He's 4,700. Um, Dallas has the number five DVP versus the wide receiver position. He has a ceiling of 14.4 um, points, a uh, floor of zero. He could be the number one. He is the number one. McLaren has been ruled out. And in this game scenario, the um, Redskins are expected to be playing from behind. He could get a lot of targets. He got a lot of targets last week. Case Keenum uh, from Case Keenum. Case Keenum will be the quarterback this week. Haskins has been ruled out. And um, this is a nice, if you're going to stack this game, say you're going to use Ezekiel Elliott, um, maybe bring it back with um, Steve Sims, you know, in the game script. If they're going to be playing from behind, it just makes sense. And at 4,700, it doesn't take much to get value. Greg Ward from Philadelphia. He is the number one wide receiver for uh, Philadelphia tomorrow. So he's, in, he's got really low ownership. I want to mention that about Sims, too. His projected ownership right now is only 1%. And he's going to be the number one receiver in a game playing from behind. Greg Ward. He's got 2%. He's the number one 
option and offense that needs to win to secure the NFC East title. And Zach Ertz has been ruled out, which provides even more targets. So definitely have a lot of interest in Greg Ward as well. John Ross from Cincinnati, 4,500. He uh, Cleveland has a number seven DVP versus the wide receiver position. He has a ceiling of 21.92 points, a floor of zero. Last week he had 13 targets in a meaningless game. Now he's playing a divisional rival at home. His floor is dangerous, but the fact that they weren't playing for anything last week and now they're playing at home in a game uh, with their division rival, Cleveland Browns, and he got 13 targets last week. Why couldn't he get that many? I mean, if he got 13 targets this week at 4,500, I mean, unless he just dropped every pass, which I don't think is going to happen. But I, I really like um, Ross in this situation, and um, I'll have some exposure to him. He's only 3% ownership right now. Brandon Cooks from the Rams. I think he's really he's only 4,400. His price is just bottomed out this year. Um the Cardinals have a 23 DVP versus the wide receiver position. He's averaging, or he has a ceiling 11.31, a floor 2.29. He's got 5% ownership. I think he's sneaky in a really good matchup versus Arizona and low ownership. I think he could um, have a potentially a big game, um, whether golf starts or Bortles starts. That's kind of up in the air. But Cooks doesn't have any injuries, and I think he's going to um, play tomorrow. And that's how you attack the uh, Cardinals is through the air. So he could be really sneaky, and uh, he has the potential to to bust a slate. So I have a lot of interest in Cooks tomorrow. Russell Gage from Atlanta is 4,400. Um, Tampa Bay number 32 DVP versus the wide receiver position. He has a ceiling of 13.35 and a uh, floor 2.97. He's Got 2% ownership right now. He's just another stack piece in the high total game. And it could be a pivot off of uh, Julio Jones as well. Kelvin Harmon, wide receiver Washington. He's 3,900. Dallas, number five DVP versus wide receiver position. He has an 8.79 ceiling and a 1.36 floor. 1% ownership. Inexpensive. He is the number two for Washington with uh, McLaren being ruled out and um, in a game script where they should be playing from behind. Really like that. Last, Arcega Whiteside from Philadelphia. He's 3,700. Um, the Giants, number 30 DVP versus the wide receiver position. He has a ceiling of 6.77 and a floor of 1.45. I think his ceiling should be uh, higher. He's the number two wide receiver in a game where the Eagles can clinch the NFC East with a win, Ertz is ruled out, um, so there's going to be more targets available, and it doesn't take much at 3,700 to get value. He's only get, sitting at 2% ownership right now, so um, I think his ceiling and his floor should definitely be higher due to the circumstances in Philadelphia. Okay, lastly is the defensive special teams that I'm going to be targeting. I have the New England Patriots. They're the top option this week at 4,300 playing Miami. Miami's kind of been the cheap cheat code this year as far as the team that you want to play your players against, want to play your defense against. Um, Fitzpatrick's put together some nice games this year, um, but this is a different um, team here playing in New England who's playing for a first-round bye with a really good defense. Um, I think... The Dolphins are up against it tomorrow. Fantastic matchup at home as a double-digit favorite. Miami should be playing from behind, forcing them to the air in a difficult matchup versus New England's pass defense. If I can get up to them, I will um, have a lot of exposure to the Patriots' defense. New Orleans Saints, they're $300 cheaper than the Patriots playing Carolina. They're facing a rookie quarterback, Greyer, who threw three interceptions last week in his first start. Should be playing from behind in a game New Orleans needs to win. Playing from behind means you need, have to throw the ball, and that sets up sacks, sack fumbles, pick sixes, and all kinds of things. And that's another reason I like New Orleans running game, too. I think that the defense is going to be able to to do um, some things to the uh, Carolina offense. 
Cowboys 3300 playing Washington. Dallas needs to win for the Giants Eagles game to be even relevant. Washington should be playing from behind in a difficult matchup. Dallas pass defense pretty good. Their pass rush. I um, think they're going to get try to get some pressure on Keenum. And in a game with a lot of emotion, um, the Cowboys really disappointing this year. Ravens 3100 playing Pittsburgh. They're facing undrafted rookie quarterback Hodge, I believe is his name. And Ravens could probably go overlooked due to uh, they're expected to be resting a lot of players. They're not. They don't really. They've already secured home field advantage through the playoffs. I think their defense could go overlooked, but they're playing a rookie quarterback on the road who's trying to get in the playoffs and pressure breaks pipes. And they could be really sneaky at 3,100. And there's no doubt, even though they're sitting players, the Ravens still would like nothing more than to just knock Pittsburgh right out of the playoffs, which that will happen. And the Houston-Tennessee game will be irrelevant if they lose to Baltimore. The Bears at 2,100. They're my um, top pay down option versus Minnesota. Minnesota's expected to rest many starters as they have nothing to gain in advance of their wild card game next weekend. It doesn't take much to get value at 2100 so I really like them as a spin down option that allows you to spend up in a lot of places. And I added the Packers. Um, I meant to have them in there when I was putting this together the last couple days. They're 3000 playing Detroit. Double-digit favorite versus a rookie quarterback, which means if they're going to be playing from behind double digits, he's going to have to throw the ball in a game. As I said, they should be playing from behind, which should create the opportunity for defensive points. And I like stacking the Packers with running back Aaron Jones. So that was a lot of information. Hopefully you are able to screenshot it. Use it how you uh, like, and um, I will. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you a manual lineup that I built use, using this player pool, and I'm also going to show you a um, optimized lineup, and we'll talk about that when we get there. I did want to mention real quick, and we can get over here to wide receivers, some wide receiver information. Um, some wide receivers that I don't – uh, have on here Tyler Boyd he is for Cincinnati he is getting a 24% target share he's got a really good matchup tomorrow against Cleveland's uh, carry who's allowing a 116.2 quarterback rating uh, Rand Randall Cobb for Dallas he's getting 15% target share versus uh, ball for Washington who's given up a 137.7 quarterback rating Amari Cooper has the best matchup on paper tomorrow He's getting 20% target share, and he's going against Colvin, who is allowing a 152.6 quarterback rating. Um, some others here. Sanu from New England is getting a 14% target percentage. He's going against Needham for Miami, who's allowing a 114 quarterback rating. And um, Ward from uh, Philadelphia, which we do have him on here. This is some, another reason I have him in green. Is going against Ballantyne for the Giants, who's allowing a 131.2 quarterback rating. So those are some uh, interesting numbers for um, wide receivers. And what I want to do now is I want to show you guys the manual lineup that I've built utilizing this player pool. And then, I'm gonna sh and then we're going to do the optimized one. But utilizing that player pool that I have, this is a lineup that I've been working on. And, and the whole point of this video isn't to give you my picks or um, player. You, it's to show you my process, the players that I'm targeting, why I'm targeting, and show you how I put lineups together. Um, and I'm going to have McCaffrey. I'm going to have Sony Michelle. I'm going to have Sterling Shepard. I'm going to have Greg Ward, who is 4,700. Let's see here. There he goes. Um, Watson from Tampa Bay. Hooper. 
from Atlanta. And sometimes what I do with this, like I'll make this line up and then I'll build off of it. I'll maybe I'll take McCaffrey out, plug Henry in, spend up in other places. But I'm going to talk about this when I get to, um, when I get done here. Uh, the last, I want, um, Flex, I want Damian Williams. He is um, running back for Kansas City. He's 4,700. And that left me 2,300, and I get to use the defense that I like a lot. So there you go. Um, spent 49,800. I got Ryan uh, teamed up with Hooper, bringing it back with a P, uh, receiver from Tampa Bay. It's a small game stack. I got McCaffrey, um, who I like. I just want to lock in those 30 points. I feel like I'll get that. Um, Sony Michelle, who I think is going to go overlook and, and under own tomorrow in a game that New England can control with their running game and their defense. Um, Sterling Shepard and Greg Ward, um, two receivers from a game that I think will have some scoring and how the best way to move the ball against these teams is through the air. These are the, um, the top targets in those games. And I have, um, Damian Williams, the running back for Kansas City. I think that's a nice pivot off of the Kansas or the yeah the Kansas City passing game and the Bears defense, which I, I really like in their um, in that game scenario with Minnesota expected to sit a lot of players. So that's using the player pool that I just went over with you guys, um, and I, I really like this lineup. I'll be using it and I'll build off of it. I don't. Um, um, MME mean I don't play the 150 lineups. I don't have anything against anybody that does. It makes totally total sense. If I'm ever the, in the position to do it, I will be doing it. Um, but I play different contests. I play some head to head. I might play the one dollar uh, twenty max entry or the twenty five cent twenty max entry, and I play you know the Millie Maker, the big the twenty dollar one. And I might play a couple tens and then I just spread it out. And then I build off, like this is something that I really like here. And then I'll build off this and I'll just move a few things around. And um, that's how I do it. Like I said, my process might involve, you know, taking McCaffrey out and popping um, maybe Aaron Jones in there, which leaves me 2000 which allows me to spend up in other spots. Um that makes me, that allows me to get to the number one for um, Tampa Bay. I still have 200, and that's how I do it. Now, what I also do is I utilize an optimizer. And for anybody who may be new to this um, channel, what I do is I take the players, that player pool that I just showed you, I take all those players and I put them in optimizer that I use from a paid site. And I set up just a few rules like quarterbacks. Um, I want at least one target of a wide receiver, or a tight end with my quarterback. The only quarterback I never did that with that I didn't require that with was Lamar Jackson. And he's not playing this week. Um, so, and then I put things like, I don't want two running backs from the same team. I don't want two tight ends from the same team. And I might match up. Like I might put, if I have, if using, uh, Aaron Rodgers, I want Devontae Adams. And then I put some exposure limits. Like I never want more. I set it for 150 lineups and I never want more than 20%. But usually I go through and I look at the projected ownership numbers and I just, what I like, like if a player is projected at 10% and I really like them more, I might put ownership at 18%. And I go through and I set that all up. I set it for three unique players for every lineup. So every lineup has to have at least three unique players. I set it for 150 lineups. And this week it actually gave me 146 lineups. Sometimes it gives me um, less. Sometimes it gives me 150 on the dot. And that tells me either there's more possible randomizations or I just got lucky and hit it right on 150. I'm thinking it's because there's more. And a few, four times this year, 
the optimizer has actually produced a lineup that outscored the um, winning lineup for the Millie Maker, um, which I use each week from DraftKings as my measuring stick. I look at the winning lineup for the Millie Maker, and I look at um, the results in my players. And four times this year, my optimizer actually produced with my player pool the lineup that would outscored. Uh, that particular lineup. So I let it go. And like I said, this time it gave me 146. And I always share with you guys uh, one, usually the first uh, lineup that it, it gives me. And remember, this is just using the players that I had in the player pool. And the main reason I do this is because if I play a lot of different contests, I just want to see the different randomizations of the players that I like. And this allows me to do that, and I can go through and look at the ones. And I adjust some of them, and a lot of times that burns me. Um, burned me last week on in, in the uh, Sims wide receiver from uh, Washington. I had him in there. I added him late, and I was getting a lot of him. But um, I was like, I don't know much, much about this game or this player, and I thought that it was just putting him in there because – it allowed me to spend up in other places and I mean, had a really good game. So um, I try not to bother it too much unless a player's out. And um, this is a lineup that was generated from the optimizer using that player pool. It had Jameis Winston at quarterback, Aaron Jones at running back, Damian Williams at running back, He's 4,700. Keenan Allen at wide receiver is 6,100. Watson from Tampa Bay, 4,900. O.J. Howard, wide receiver. Greg Ward, I'm sorry, Greg Ward, then O.J. Howard. Greg Ward, wide receiver. O.J. Howard, tight end. It's another piece to go with Winston. Derrick Henry, running back, and the flex. And defense special teams allowed me to get to the Bears again. And this one was um, 49,700. So there you go. You got Winston teamed up with Watson and Howard. Um, some good running backs, Aaron Jones, Henry, and Williams. That's really interesting. Bring them uh, Keenan Allen, part of a stack with uh, Damian Williams. So that's, that's really interesting. And you have, um, that's about it on the, yeah, nothing stacked there with Jones. So this was an optimized lineup using the player pool that we just went over. And um, I hope that you guys are able to use this information. Uh, a couple people reached out to me from last week, said using my player pool, they were able to put together some lineups and uh, win some money. One person in particular told me that that was the most that they've ever won, which is really what I want to hear. I'm rooting for you, for you guys. And um, this is the information I use, and this is how I do it. I want to thank you guys for joining me. Hopefully you were able to hang in there for this whole video. It's a lot of information, about an hour and a half long. Um, but I hope it's of some use to you and you get it uh, well enough in advance so you can uh, do something with it. I encourage you to please drop any opinions or comments that you may have uh, below. Some of you have reached out. Um, one person in particular last week reached out and um made some requests and some suggestions and I uh, actually implemented that week that this week with the um, ceiling and floor feature and as I move forward in building this um, this channel um, I will add and, and make it better and um, use things and numbers that are um, you know that may, may help us even more I'm looking I'm always looking to learn and um, willing to listen to people. And um, I, so I really appreciate your uh, input. Please share this video, like it, subscribe if you're not already a subscriber, and hit that notification bell so you get notified when my next video posts. 
my subscribers have really went up and uh, my viewers have went way, way up. So if you're a viewer and you're not a subscriber, please give me a chance. It doesn't cost anything. I got some really good information. Um, so I, I really appreciate it if you do that. I really want to grow this channel. I've exceeded my expectations. I, when I first started this, I didn't really know what to expect. But it's grown quickly and um, more rapidly than I expected. I will have a showdown video for tomorrow night, Sunday night game between the Seahawks and 49ers, the last um, regular season game of the year. So be looking for that tomorrow. And I will be doing playoff videos and showdown videos for some of the primetime uh, playoff games as well. So be looking for those. You can follow me on Twitter at Winning About. Again, thank you for joining me. Don't forget to check your injury reports tomorrow. There's 15 games on the main slate. You want to check for the 1 o'clock games at 11.30. And the 4 o'clock games start checking about 2.45 to 3. They should, some of those games kick off at 4.25. And they've got a large amount of games at 4.25 tomorrow. So always check that injury report, even if they don't have a designation today. They could tomorrow get sick. Last week, there was concern with Joe Mixon at the last minute that he had a stomach virus. So you always want to be aware of that. Don't take a zero. Good luck. This is the last um, regular season uh, weekend, and we'll be getting into the playoffs, and that's a whole different animal. And then I'll, um, I'm going to be reaching out and seeing if people are interested in uh, looking at the NBA and things like that as well, and baseball. Um, so, But for now... Um, I want to get this posted. Got a lot of information. Um, thank you for joining me again. My name is Ty Patton. This is all about winning daily fantasy sports, and I'll see you again real soon. Good luck tomorrow.